أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين لا سيما بقية الله في العالمين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين For the hastening the return of our Imam, please recite the salawat. So we've tried to remind ourselves about the importance of taking this blessed month of Ramadan as a month that inshallah we're going to be trying to change ourselves with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to try to do what He has taught us to inshallah try to change ourselves for the better. We try to identify what He has set for us and try to tell us in different ways to even allow us understand what great pleasure we can get to and He has created us to inshallah try to receive that mercy a mercy that no other creation a blessing that no other creation can receive except for the human being. All right. We have to learn, we have to know the value that we have. Sometimes the ulama make this an important point. A lot of times we don't become the best that we can become because we don't know our value. We don't know how good we can become. If we don't know that, then we're going to be wasting our time. There's a lot of time that we waste, a lot of time that we waste on a daily basis. On a, I'm speaking for myself, there's a lot of time that we waste. I mean, they say Atla Bahjad used to worship for, I heard lately, it's something difficult to imagine, but 13 hours of worship. Okay, 13 hours of worship. How he did it, I don't know. But as we mentioned, I think before as well, Again, I hope this is a reminder for myself more than anyone else that the day of judgment is Yawmul Hasra, the day that people are going to regret. Even the believers are going to regret. I could have done so much more just if I had recited one more verse in the month of Ramadan. If I had been able to mention or repeat this dhikr, it's easy. The adhkar that we have, they're very easy to, to say, to try to, inshallah, Bring them to our hearts. So, the reason why we waste all of that time is because we don't, we're not always at least aware, if we already know even, which we try to, and I don't think only one session is going to do the job. We have to constantly read about this, study this, see what we can actually become, try to understand that. If we do, then we won't be wasting any time. In fact, we'd leave everything to try to reach that goal. If we understand how important it is. There's one of the Urafa, one of the scholars that became an Arif. He's buried in Qum. Azullah Ansari Hamadani. They say he, he lived during the time of Aytla Burujirdi. I don't know some of you may know Aytla Burujirdi. He was... Um, one of the very strong characters and figures in ulama and maraja' before the generation of, or before uh, Ayatollah Hakim. Some of you may know Ayatollah Hakim. Before Ayatollah Hakim, the main marja was Ayatollah Buru Jardi and Qom. <coughs> One of his students was this Ayatollah Ansari Hamadani. In his 20s, he, re he reached the level of ijtihad. He studied very well. He started at an early age. 
he reached the top level of in, in fiqh and usul, which is ijtihad. He could derive the laws himself, okay? Which then gradually they can work their way to become a marja, okay? First step is ijtihad. You need to be able to derive the practical laws yourself. And then if you practice that over and over again, and you become stronger or the strongest, then people start following that. So he reached that level, then somehow a divine breeze, something hit his heart really hard. Okay. After that, he reached, he studied a lot in the Hausa, but when he was hit, he left the city of Qum. He was in the deserts trying to plead, crying, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show him the path. Because the, the regular stuff that we're talking about, we're trying to make the bare minimum step. Just the taqwa, which is just avoiding sins and performing the wajibat. Beyond that, one really needs help from an instructor. So he went out. People thought he's gone crazy. For months, he was in the deserts looking for that. If we really, if we were hit as well, if we realized what we're missing out on, it would be worth all of that. It would be worth all of that. Until he was able, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him the path. Anyhow, so we want to try to learn our value. And that's what we tried to do in one of the first sessions. I hope we think about that more and more and we're able to develop that in ourselves. So we realize what we can become. So we don't we stop wasting time, inshallah. <clears throat> now we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the path of being able to reach that destination is ibadah. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn in the ends except that they worship. And that worship is not going to benefit God. It's going to benefit the worshiper, the servant, the human being. We said one very important thing that needs to happen, or actually two things that need to happen, in order for a believer, for a person, to arrive at a state where one has considered themselves a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have no will but God's will. Something that's referred to as tafwidul amri ila Allah. I give all my affairs, here you go God, it's all yours. Whatever you want, whatever you decide, I want that. My will is your will. There's no two different wills. I want to, they refer to this even further. It reaches a state where they refer to as fana. The abd does not even see himself or herself. There is nothing but God, which is something beyond me. In order to do that, we need to come to the recognition of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, to consider Him the master. And we need to recognize and realize who we are and that we are in fact the slave. We don't want to act like a slave. We are a slave, meaning that a slave in this sense, this is why the word slave is used. A slave has nothing of themselves except for what the master gives. Okay. In this case, even our existence, there's nothing, absolutely nothing that we have that comes from ourselves. Okay. It's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to come to that understanding. One of the ways that we said we find in our sources to try to arrive at that is prayer. Because prayer has the practice, you act like an abd, you act like a slave. Because that's very important for that recognition. Just reading books, thinking, reflecting is not enough. You need to act upon that. That action itself, acting humble, acting with humility itself is going to cause the heart to start to realize and understand. Okay. And the other part of that is words and concepts 
being reminded intellectually, the intellectual reminders to come to that understanding. The prayer has a combination of both of those. The prayer brings you to act like a slave. That's why you're supposed to be sitting. You know, there's a sitting position in the prayer that the slaves had. For the brothers, this is recommended. For the sisters, there's another way that's recommended to sit. It's called tawarruk. Okay, now I can't show you how that looks right now. And there's not really a way to, to describe it in words. Um, basically, you put both legs to the right side and you sit on the left side of your body and put your hands very humbly on your thighs. And this is the way the slaves should sit in front of their masters. Okay, By acting like that, it has an effect. All right. And then the intellectual side. So we want to talk a little bit about the prayer to try to develop this in ourselves. And with this explanation that we gave, maybe we can try to understand better why Salat is considered Amududdin, the pillar of the religion. Brothers and sisters, the Amud, the pillar of the religion, means that it's something that holds there. If you have a tent, all right, the main pillar in the old days, they used to have the main pillar, and then you had uh, the ends were tied down with ropes to stones or to other, to, to something, okay, to hold that tent, all right. If some of those strings got loose a bit, that's okay. The pillar is still there, okay. If a few of them even uh, cut loose, the pillar is still holding it. It's still okay, all right. But if the pillar is gone, if everything else is tied up, it's not going to work. You're not going to have a tent. All right. The prayer is that important for an individual's religion. For ourselves, for our youth, for everybody, for all of us, brothers and sisters, no matter what we get ourselves involved with, sometimes, unfortunately, we get involved with a lot of wrong, a lot of sins. All right. Sometimes that happens. But let's try to make this a point for ourselves that no matter how bad we become and no matter what we get ourselves involved with, the worst sins on the face of the earth, don't forget about our prayer. Let's not leave that one connection there. That's the pillar. That, that can be the means through which we can come back, inshallah. Now, one other hadith that we have about the prayer, which is related to the context before getting into the prayer itself, is that the hadith says, a very beautiful hadith. It says, As-salatu qurbanu kulli taqi. Okay. Qurbanu kulli taqi. Meaning, remember we said that the goal of creation, the most profound way of understanding it, had something to do with taqarrub ila Allah, and then the climax of that, which is liqa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this one says, the path, what can cause you to get closer and causes that taqarrub and that qurban is salat. That's what prayer is. Prayer is what can really get us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to try to do it in a way where it has that effect. Some very important practical steps that we need to keep in mind in regards to the prayer to try to keep us and keep our prayers most beneficial. There's a verse in Surah Al-Baqarah that talks about this. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, "A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Hafizu 'ala as-salawati was-salati al-wusta wa qumu lillahi qanitin." All right. Be protective of your prayers. All right. Hafizu. In what sense the ahadith tell us that this is referring to the timing of the prayer. So this is one of, one of the first things that we want to make sure we get. A very important verse. The first point that we can take from this verse is emphasizing to make sure we get to perform the prayer during its time. Now some of the prayers were not like that. For the Fajr prayer... Sometimes, hopefully for the month of Ramadan, at least in order to get some of that food in us, the drink in us, to get, you know, 
little bit of energy for the day. We try to wake up, hopefully. Hopefully. Because I know people that even then, they just eat until 12 midnight and then they just knock out until 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. that they have to go to work. Well, inshallah, at least for the purpose of the suhoor, which itself is recommended, we get to get up. All right. But the other times of the year, unfortunately, sometimes we're not taking the fajr prayer seriously. That's not acceptable. Scary hadith. Uh, we're talking about something that's, you know, we're, we're shooting for the more profound goals and considering them to be our objectives to obtain. But something for some of us to get a little scared at least to move us. All right. You know, the whole carrot and stick thing. You need the stick there as well to move us sometimes. One thing that's very important for a lot of us, we cannot enter even paradise and stay away from the punishments and of hellfire without what? The shafa'ah of the Ahlul Bayt. Okay. Probably myself, I'm sure of myself. Without the shafa'ah of the Ahlul Bayt, God knows where I'm going to be ending up. Okay. And how far? That's pretty scary. All right. So we know we have this thing. We have plenty of hadith that says, if you're a Shia, if you're the follower of the Ahlul Bayt, then you have Shafa'ah. All right. We have those hadith. And sometimes we go to an extreme on mentioning that. And we kind of reach a state where we kind of uh, sound like the Christians that believe that Christ was sacrificed and he sacrificed himself for the sins of the believers. So whatever you do, it's okay. He's going to save you as long as you believe in him. Okay. So Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi. He sacrificed himself for the sins of the believers. If you shed one tear, this is true, we have hadith, one tear for Imam al Hussein with sincerity, it forgives your sins. You go to the Ahlul Bayt, the ziyarah of the Ahlul Bayt, without even asking for repentance, just intend, plan, buy your ticket, go there, leave your hotel, walk to the haram, you enter the haram of Sayyid al Shuhada, or you enter Baqi'. Or you enter Najaf, the Haram of Amirul Mu'mineen, or Imam Al Rida, or wherever else. Yeah. Brothers are saying if you can move forward a bit. Just entering that shrine, visiting the Ma'asumin, with the belief in their Imam, in their Wilaya is going to forgive our sins. Okay, we have that. This, these are true. But the way sometimes we sound is exactly how Christians sound. Yeah, you're going to be forgiven. It's okay. You can do whatever you want. Okay, that's not the message that the Ahlul Bayt are trying to give us. There's very, very, uh, even scarier than the one I'm about, about to mention, a hadith about this, that say, look, just the love of the Ahlul Bayt visiting, that's not enough. It says, without the ta'ah and the worship, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can't get you anywhere. We have loads of those ahadith as well. The Ahlul Bayt didn't want to give us this feeling of security that we're okay on the day of judgment. Do as you wish, as long as you believe in us. No. That was something to give us hope that, okay, look, whatever you've done, you can still get back on track. That's the objective of those. Don't ever lose hope. That's what those ahadith are trying to say. Not that just do whatever you want. Okay, now, getting back to the scary hadith that we wanted to talk about. We need that shafa'ah. A lot of us need that shafa'ah. Hadith, a number of times. Imam al-Sadiq, salamullah alayhi, in one instance... When, according to the hadith, he was poisoned. And when the poison had its effect, and he knew that this is his, he's not going to be living much longer, he asked for his relatives to all gather. 
These are the close relatives of the Imam. He gathered them to give them advice. A person who speaks before they pass away, their message is going to be a very the most important message that they have. Okay, and that's why it's so important that although they're in bed, they want to gather people. So there were a couple of things. Two of them were related to Shafa'ah. He said, Salamullah alayhi, that لا تنال شفاعتنا من استخف بالصلاة. Those who take prayer lightly, they're not going to receive our shafa'ah. That's one of those sins that we can't do anything about. You're going to have to at least have that prayer. Okay. One of the ways that they say we are going to be considered of those who take prayer lightly is that if we don't care if we really pray it on time or not. If I don't plan the night before to arrange my sleep schedule so that I do wake up for the Fajr prayer, I'm careless. That's istighfaf bit salat. That's taking it lightly. If I've arranged my day such that when the dhuhr time comes in, I'm involved with work and school and I don't even have time to perform my prayers. Is there any way that I could do it while I'm sitting in class? No. You have to make that time to perform that prayer. Okay? It's interesting because this verse that we recited, Hafidhu ala salawat was salatil wusta. Salatul wusta, according to the ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt, it's the midday prayer, salatul dhuhr. Okay? That's when we're very busy with different activities and because of that we may miss that. It says it's emphasizing. It's a verse of the Holy Quran. Emphasizing. Make sure you do it during the time. You don't miss out on the time. Okay. In Maghrib and Isha as well. Got to make sure we do that. But usually the Fajr and the Dhuhr and As is something that we are a little more reluctant towards. And we take that hadith and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the rights of the Ahlul Bayt to help us take our hand so that we are able to get in the habit of that. But that's not where it ends when it comes to timing. If I'm a true slave, all right, the best slave isn't someone that when the master says they're just busy with their video games or watching their football game or TV, cartoons, movie, whatever, activities housework, uh, other work that I'm involved with, I just continue with that. And yeah, yeah, I heard the call. Okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. And then at the end, or whenever, not really caring, sometime, at least we get it during the time, but even then we really don't care, beginning of time, you know, midway through that time, or at the end of it. That's not a real slave. A real slave is just waiting for that call. Okay? We have hadith that's beneficial and it's recommended to come and sit in the masjid before the time of the prayer comes. To say that, oh master, ya Allah, I'm waiting, I know it's approaching, that time is approaching, I'm preparing myself. I'm ready for it, I'm waiting for it. Not that, well, in this country you don't have the sound of adhan being played from the minarets, if you have any minarets here. Um, but even countries like you hear the adhan, but then sometimes you find people they're busy with the same old activity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, The time has come, you want to come to speak to me? Like, yeah, later, inshallah, I'll speak to you later. I got this thing that's more important right now. Let me get involved with this. Let me finish this. Okay. No, they say that if we want to be a true slave, our utmost effort should be put into making those prayers up right at the beginning of time. And it's very, very effective to push us more towards the final goal and the final destination. One of the Urafa, Sayyid Ali Ghay Qadhi, has said, it's an instruction that is very widespread. And from anyone who wants to start on any path, they always get these little hand, handouts that have this statement mentioned by Said Ali Qadhi that he said, make sure your prayer every time is right at the beginning of the time. And if you do this, if you're looking for instructions for spirituality, this is one of them. 
if you do this, it's guaranteed that you're going to be receiving spiritual blessings. Okay, you're going to move above and beyond. And he says, he's so confident in this that he says, if you don't, okay, I promise you that you will. But if you practice this continuously, not once a blue moon, not for a couple of days, not just for a week, this has got to become the routine of our life. I'm always checking the times to know exactly when that time is. All right? And make sure I pray at the beginning of that time. He says, if you continuously do that and you don't see any spiritual blessings, you can curse me. I'll give you that freedom to go ahead and curse me. That's how confident he is. And if you know, I don't know if you've read anything about Sayyid Ali Qadi, he's top-notch. You wouldn't believe some of those stories about him, who he was, what type of blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him. It's really unbelievable. So I won't take time talking about that. Anyway, that's one thing. Another thing about the prayer to try to make sure we get the most out of it is to try to find the right place for that prayer. It's important. There's a bit of concentration required. I need to know what I'm doing. Okay. At least in the initial stages because the if one has reached the higher levels, if they've practiced, if they've surpassed these levels, then they could stand right in the middle of the street, cars passing by, and still concentrate and be speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi on the day of Ashura. Forget about war. We're at work, we forget about prayer. He's in the middle of the war. All the worries of what's going to happen to them, what's going to happen to the family, all of that's there. People are coming. He's standing there performing his prayer. Okay. One can reach that. But initially, our minds are all over the place. One of the ways to try to concentrate is to try to designate a certain place where there's less noise, less distractions, whether it's at home or elsewhere. Less distractions. Of course, now I'm that I'm on this point of, I mentioned the, the home, I also need to say that it's a good idea that the parents and also the, the youth, if they have younger siblings, it's good for them not to go hiding either for their prayers. Okay, It shouldn't be like their prayers are done where nobody can see them. Another thing about that is uh, we want to pray where the children can see. It shouldn't be such that the parents don't see, uh, sorry the children don't see the parents praying. It's important. That's how you practically teach the children that it's important to pray. If they see you praying, if they see it's a regular routine, a certain time of the day is the time for prayer, then telling them to pray is going to be a lot easier, okay? They will learn that this is how we should be. Also, the older siblings trying to do that so the younger siblings can also see. But at the same time, trying to balance this, okay, try to find a place where it's there's less distractions. At the same time, don't be hiding somewhere in a you know locked room. No one can see you at all. Sometimes for the night prayers, for instance, that'll be a good thing. But for the regular prayers, try not to do that. Another thing that we have, all these are preparations for the prayer. In our wudu, we have hadith. Well, before that hadith, you know, this wudu that we perform, there's a lot of du'as that are recommended. When you look at the tap water, if you're using the tap, look in the water, okay, there's a du'a for it. Then when you rinse your mouth out, there's a du'a for it. When you rinse your nose out, there's a du'a for it. When you take the first hand to try to wash your face, there's a du'a for it. You start with bismillah, then you... Wash your face. There's a dua for it. Allahumma bayyid wajhi. There's a dua for the right hand, the left hand, wiping the head. All these duas are there so that we kind of get uh, away from the distractions that we were in. 
re start getting into the mood of prayer it's important we don't just go in there not knowing even or having a conversation sometimes it's not possible somebody's talking to us we need to you know it'll be rude if we say and we don't have time to postpone it but if that's always the case, we're always running into the washroom or wherever it is that we're making the wudu and just making a quick wudu and coming back out, that's not something that's good. We should try to give time to that. Then we have the adhan and the iqama. There's so much emphasis on this adhan and the iqama. Standing there, you know, I need to do my prayers, Allahu Akbar, without even coming to a full stop, you know, running in there. Sometimes we see that. There's a hadith. From the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was in the masjid with some of his companions. This guy comes in. I don't know if he ran or not, but sometimes we see that too. And people come quickly and before they even stable enough. Allahu Akbar. And well, I don't know if we can really call that prayer the way they do that. It kind of looks like gymnastics, you know, going up and down, jumping sometimes it seems as though. This guy also did it similar, to, something similar to that. Very quickly to Ruku. It didn't take much time. He got like, shot, up, shot down to Sujood quickly up and back, you know, really quick. The Holy Prophet said, if this man dies and this is the way he prays, he's not one of us. Okay, This is not how you pray. This is like a crow picking the ground. This is not prayer. Okay. So, when we come in, all right, there's even steps. The very least, adhan and iqamah. It doesn't take much time either. The adhan and the iqamah are so important that it is said, according to the majority of the maraja, breaking your prayer after you've started the takbiratul ihram is what? Can you do that or not? They say you can't. Okay. They say it's haram. You're not supposed to do that unless there's a legitimate reason. Okay, so now if you get an excuse, if you're told that you can actually break your prayer for something, that means that that is important. One of them is iqama. Okay, if you started your prayer, you forgot about it, you started your prayer and you remembered, oh, I didn't do the iqama. It's recommended, not haram, recommended to break that prayer, do the iqama, and then engage in prayer. Okay, so these are steps that we take to try to prepare ourselves, our minds for this prayer. Recite a salawat, please. When we get to the prayer itself, one of the objectives or one of the things that's going to lead, remember we said that according to the verses of the Holy Quran, the main objective that we're trying to reach from prayer is a dhikr okay remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what way what are we trying to accomplish remember we said that we need to come to that recognition the realization that we are in fact the slaves and he is the master we need to come to that realization right so that's why it is said one of the qualities of the believers in Surah Al-Mu'minun. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ The quality of khushu' in the prayer has to be developed. All right. The quality of khushu'. What is this? How does this translate? It means that if, if you feel yourself as an insignificant slave, okay, powerless, insignificant slave. You're going to someone that has everything. You look at yourself and you look at him. How do you feel? How would you feel? One realizes the insignificance okay, of themselves and the glory of the other party. And that is the feeling of khushu'. He has everything. He Everything belongs to him. He is the one that has all the power to punish and he has all the mercy. All right. And I'm the one that has nothing of myself. The feeling of khushu. To 
develop that one of the things that we find in prayer we just talked about very briefly is trying to remain calm in the state of qiyam for instance you know the state of standing itself for worship for prayer is something that is encouraged I'll give you a couple of references one is Amir al-Mu'mineen salamullah alayhi One day after Fajr, you know, the Imam, a lot of his training of the people, most of it actually, and the guidance that he provided for the people happened after he became the so called Khalifa, meaning that he was given that authority. People recognized his authority, they allowed him to rule, they accepted that. A lot of his guidance comes from then. The dua, for instance, dua al Kumail is something that comes. From that point onwards, Kumail ibn Ziyad al Nakhai is one of the companions of the Imam after that happened. All right. One day after Salatul Fajr, he would usually, according to this report, he would usually turn around after he led the prayers in Masjid al Kufa. We all hope that we get the benefit and the tawfiq to inshallah visit Masjid al Kufa and visit where the Imam used to give his sermons. He would turn around and he would address the people. And he started to describe the believers to try to get the people to get encouraged to feel like they want to become. So during the time of the Holy Prophet, we had believers that would get up in the middle of the night, night and they would worship in the standing position so much that they would get tired on standing on, usually when we stand, Okay, we're standing on both legs. Okay, then you get tired, you start resting one, you stand on the other one. Then you start resting the other one if you need to continue standing and you stand on the other. And you go back and forth. The Imam says they kept going back and forth, back and forth. That's how long they would have to, not have to, but they chose to stand worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he describes further their worship. And then he says, with all of that, they had they still feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's something at another time maybe we can emphasize on. And I think we've already done that, but we need to do more of that, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the standing. Another is a saying about the lady Fatima to Zahra, salamullah alayha. And she was a true worshipper. She only, according to the Ahadith, had 18 years to live. But she was a real worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A real worshipper. Everything she did was for the sake of Allah. We know all of that, of course. And doing what no one else could do in protecting the wilaya of Amir al-Mumin sallallahu but what I want to say right now about her that is less heard of is that she used to worship in the standing position to the extent that her legs would be swollen. Okay, She would stand in worship that long. And she would enjoy it. That's what a true slave is like. A true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like. When we are standing in that position, remaining calm, motionless, trying to reflect this idea that we are speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's very important for us, for us to constantly be realizing and remembering that we're speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now keeping that body still, there's a hadith that says about, I believe it's Imam al-Sajjad salamullah alayhi, that... <clears throat> Again, this is one of the Imams that is known for worship. After all, he's Sayyidu Sajideen, or another term that we use for him is Zainul Abideen. Okay. So they say that when you would see him praying, you would just see, see a man standing very motionless and still, and the only thing that would be moving would be his clothes and his robes when the wind would blow. Okay completely still try to keep that calm another thing is humility as I said acting 
doing things, standing in a way where that humility is portrayed. Okay. That action itself is going to have an effect. That's why we have the instructions about how to stand. All right. The men are supposed to stand putting their hands while they're standing on their thighs. Okay, it causes your shoulders to kind of fall down. If you try to feel a little more humble, your head goes a little further down, not too far down. Bending it too far down is not something that we've been told. We've actually been discouraged of that. But, uh, you know, if one just realizes, tries to think, you automatically kind of bend a little bit. If you would see the ulama praying, like Ayatollah Bahjat, for instance, he would always be in that position, a little bent, you know, that feeling of humility could be seen in him. In ruku, bending fully, okay, all the way. They say it's even, we have hadith, that it's recommended in the state of ruku to try to extend your neck a bit while your, your back is straight. You don't put your head, you don't just throw it down like that. You hold it straight, bend it a little bit, okay, and try to, you know, kind of extend it a bit. Meaning that this neck is yours, Ya Allah. Whenever you decide for it to be gone, it's, it's all yours. It's at your control, okay, with that intention. Then, standing up, again, one practical law, sometimes people don't even know this. It's a wajib when we get up from ruku to stand still for a second, at least. Okay? And also that when we are saying the adhkar, we're not supposed to be moving. If we do, it doesn't even count. Even from a faqhi perspective. If I say, Sama'allahu liman hamidallahu akbar. All of that in motion. That's not going to count. And according to some at least, it's going to invalidate the prayer. We can't do that. You have to be still and say that. The next thing that we would want to go over are the meanings of some of the adhkar, which our time is up. Inshallah, we'll try to cover that in the next session. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the right of the Ahlul Bayt, by the right of the Imam of our time, that he hastens the return of our Imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of the Ahlul Bayt, by the right of our beloved Imam, Imam al hujja that he enables us to train ourselves. He trains us to become the true companions of our beloved Imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prolong the life of and give good health to all those who are helping the cause of Islam, especially the Maraja and especially, and especially the leader. We ask Him to forgive us all of our sins. We ask Him to forgive our parents, our relatives, our grandparents, all believers, especially those who have taught us a word in Islam, those who are alive, those who have passed away. We ask Him to forgive them all of their sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve all believers of the pains and sufferings that they are facing. We ask Him to cure all the ill, especially those of those who are re related to and or actually the brothers and sisters that have been participating to cure all of them inshallah we ask him to give all the mu'mineen their hajat their needs what they request all their needs whether material or spiritual we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve all the people of the world of the oppressions that they are facing inshallah bin nabi wa alih rahimallahu man qara'a al-fatihata ma'as-salawat